stage at Houston. Are you ready for the event? We are ready for the event. KGO TV, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is KGO TV. How do you hear me? KGO, we have you loud and clear. Uh, happy to have you on board the station. Thanks for talking with us this morning. I want to address my first question to Kate, who's our hometown astronaut. Uh, folks back at your high school and at Stanford are awfully proud of you. How do you feel about all the support you're getting from back home and uh, about the school assembly you're going to get to do with Vintage High? Well, it's really fantastic to know that folks at home are supporting us. Uh, we're on this orbital outpost, and we circle the globe all the time. But every time we have a pass over the U.S. and over California, I try to make sure and look out and wave a little bit to everybody down below. Kay, this was a long road for you getting to be an astronaut. I, I heard you had to learn Russian, learn to fly a fighter jet. Um, how long did you have to do all that, and uh, how are your Russian and flying skills now? Well, uh, it's about a seven-year uh, process total that's been for me so far, and that includes a couple years at the beginning when we first get to NASA. It, we do take a lot of language training. That never stops. We work really closely with our Russian colleagues. Uh, and part of our training does involve aviation. It's an excellent uh, preparation and excellent training for spaceflight. And so uh, I have to say those are two of my favorite things that we've had on board the space station. Uh, preparation for training up, on, up here on space station are the Russian lessons and the flying. Back here on Earth, you studied HIV. Is the research you're doing in space going to help us understand viruses and, and that sort of illness in a different way than what we were able to do here on Earth? And, and what are, where are you in the process of setting up that research? Yeah, so I actually studied uh, HIV as well as uh, Ebola, smallpox, Marburg, and Lhasa, uh, a lot of the really dangerous ones. So we don't have those on space station, but we are understanding how viruses in the immune system interact. And there's actually a really interesting phenomenon on board where you get some dormant virus reactivation in the human body. So I think we're seeing a lot of really undiscovered things. Uh, there's a lot of immunology research, and we're just uh, working on some cell culture and cardiac research today. There's just a whole variety of things to explore about human health up here. Jeff, what can you tell us about Kate as a crewmate? What's it been like teaching her the ropes of living in space, and what are you hoping you can learn from her once her research gets going? Uh, well, it's always fun to, uh, to be able to share the experience with somebody for the first time, and both uh, Kate and Takuya um, came up together uh, for their first flight. And uh, they've been uh, um, a lot of fun to have on board. They bring a lot of enthusiasm on board. Of course, they, they hit the ground running, figuratively speaking, and uh, they both are doing very well. And, and of course, she brings a, uh, a unique background to the crew and with her science background and uh, is, is certainly helping me appreciate uh, the science and the research that we have going on board now, as well as uh, what it looks like we're going to be doing in the future. Uh, Jeff and then Kate, what are the things that you guys absolutely just love about being up there in space? And, and, and for Kate specifically, maybe what are, what are the things that are different from what you expected and what you might miss most about Earth? Well, I've uh, spent a little bit of time up here, but I never get tired of looking out the window and seeing the Earth and uh, seeing the wide variety of things that you can see from the weather systems to the ground features to the water features uh, to the sunrises, sunsets, aurora. We were watching aurora this morning, um, and uh, it, you just, uh, you're just you always uh, finding something new when you look out the window. Yeah, and for me, I think one of the most amazing things was actually that view when you're orbiting the planet. And I frankly thought I wasn't going to be that surprised by it. You work a number of years in mission control. We're used to seeing photographs and videos from space. And uh, it's really quite surprising when you get up here how striking our planet is. I remember my first thought just being, wow, you know, we live on a planet. And uh, it's truly amazing to see um, that hasn't worn off yet. I'm like Jeff, I'm still amazed every time I look out the window and, and see our Earth go by. Kate, as a, as a first time space traveler, how is the food up there? Do you get to eat any Russian food or is it all American food? And did you manage to bring any Napa Valley wine with you? 
It's uh, it's really phenomenal food up here. Um, so we get Russian food. Uh, we we can eat dinner with our Russian colleagues, and we all share food together. We get American food. Uh, my Japanese crewmate has brought some Japanese food. Uh, we've brought things like hot sauces from around the world. So it's actually really phenomenal cuisine. Uh, unfortunately, there's no wine on board Space Station, um, but it's just a, a really wonderful. Uh, food environment. That's one of the great things, actually, about sharing some meal times with your crewmates. Is we get to try each other's food and talk a little bit about each other's culture and cuisine. Now, the two of you are scheduled for a spacewalk. So, Kate, what have you been doing to prepare for that spacewalk? And Jeff, what can you or have you been able to tell Kate about the experience of installing large hardware on that International Space Station? Yeah, so actually after we finish talking to you, we're going to go into the airlock and, and finish doing some more activities for some prep for the spacewalk. We've at this point uh, outfitted our suits. We've assembled all the parts onto the suits, the gloves and the boots, and uh, started to gather all the hardware that's needed for the spacewalk. And I think Jeff can tell you a little bit more about the actual experience. Yeah, we've been talking about it. Obviously, uh, when you go through the training, uh, and in preparing for it, you talk to a lot of the folks that have done them before. So Kate has a good idea uh, of what's coming up. Uh, but until you experience it, of course, it's it's just not quite the same. So we spend a lot of time talking about what it's really like out there. We don't have the, the, the gravity that we feel in the pool when we do the training. So what are the differences there? We don't lose lar or move large mass objects uh, on the ground like we do here. So it's a little bit different. Some of those things we can practice inside with heavy objects. And the, but we're going to be talking through the choreography of the spacewalk uh, over and over again so that we we don't have to uh, use a checklist we can we know it basically by heart and of course uh, we'll be talking our, our our way through that when we're outside we talk about the space station as a floating or an orbiting laboratory what, what's the kind of science you can do up there that you just can't do on earth and i understand you've got this tiny dna sequencer and, and even some cell cultures from stanford why, why would you do that work in space as opposed to on earth yeah, that's a really great question, and, and we evaluate all of the research that we send up here uh, for specifically uh, for why do we need to use microgravity or the space environment to answer these questions. So, for example, with the cells, the cardiomyocytes that we're using from Stanford, those are heart cells. And one of the things that we're very interested in is cardiovascular function in space. As you get all this fluid shift uh, in your body, the, the gravity vector is no longer draining fluid into your legs. And that actually affects the cardiovascular system. The second part of that is just the technology development aspect of can we do cell culture in space. Uh, on the Earth, you would always have a fluid medium that's floating on top of the cells and is stuck to the cells. Up here, the water forms droplets and floats away. So we have some specialized technology to keep all of that cell culture medium uh, together. And, and we're doing the kind of demonstrations that show that we can do cell culture and we can grow any kind of cells in space to investigate some really fascinating principles about how the cells grow, divide, organize their structure, signal to each other, and even DNA changes with the small sequencer. What are you uh, hoping to talk to the folks at Vintage High School about? What, what could you say to them now, and what are you hoping to talk to them about when you do that assembly with them uh, in, in a little while? Well, I think any time you get a chance to talk to students, it's just fantastic. Um, it really is inspiring to us, and we draw a lot from their enthusiasm. They're always extremely interested and curious about spaceflight, what we're doing up here. A lot of the questions that you have about the research that we do in the orbiting laboratory, we'll get that from students as well. So it's really fun for us just to be able to share a little bit of our experience and what it's like actually living and working in space on the International Space Station. Last question, what do you do with your free time? Is there Pokemon Go in space? So I got a great piece of advice before flight, which was don't do anything in space that you can do uh, on the ground. So we actually uh, spend a lot of our time looking at the Earth, taking pictures. Um, I'm sort of always poking around for a new science experiment to do. Uh, the ground's always got lots of work for us, and, and uh, it's pretty fun work, so we enjoy doing a lot of that in our free time. Uh, I, and I'll let Jeff uh, let you know what he likes to do, too. 
Well, for me, uh, like I mentioned before, you never get tired of viewing the Earth. So I, I've uh, had a hobby up here of taking a lot of photography to try to capture uh, the images that you get and bring the vantage point back to the folks on Earth. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the KGO TV portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from the History Channel. Station, this is History. How do you hear me? History Channel, we have you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the International Space Station. Hey, glad to be here. How's it going? Good morning. Jack Osborne here. It's going very well. Good we morning. stay very Jack busy up here. here. Ah, good times, good times. Well, thanks for joining us for the uh, first ever Facebook Live event. Uh, now, I know we've only got 10 minutes, so uh, let's get to it. Uh, Jeff, Kate, can you introduce yourselves and tell us how long you've been at the station for? Um, I'm Jeff Williams, and I launched uh, with my Russian crewmates, two Russian crewmates, in March, uh, and scheduled to return to Earth in early September. Kate Rubens, and I've been here just almost a month. Ah, cool. Uh, how are you guys uh, enjoying it? I'm assuming it's the best job ever. Yeah, it, there's no denying that. It's absolutely fantastic up here. Um, everything is, is surprising. Uh, it feels like the laws of physics have either changed or been extremely reinforced. And so I'm having a great time. Uh, a lot of this is new to me. Awesome. Now, while in orbit, can you tell us about the work you guys have done so far and, and what you guys are currently working on right now? Well, the work is ongoing. We've had continuous human presence here in the space station for going on 16 years now. Uh, and, of course, uh, many of those uh, early years were spent uh, assembling this uh, magnificent orbital outpost. Now it's in the full utilization mode, so it's an orbiting laboratory. We've got a lot of experiments going on, and they're always coming and going, so we're doing something new across the spectrum of all the sciences. Of course, this is a big, complex orbiting laboratory that needs to be maintained, so we spend time maintaining it. Uh, we also spend some time repairing it when things break. Um, and occasionally, like we're looking forward to in a, in a few weeks here, we get to go outside, do a spacewalk, and do those same kinds of activities, um, either ma uh, repairing or maintaining the station. In this case, we're going to be adding a docking adapter uh, for future uh, uh, crewed vehicles. Very cool. Now, do you guys operate on a seven-day work week? Do they give you any downtime? Yeah, so we actually work um, about a five and a half day work week. We get a little bit of free time to look out the window and see the earth. Uh, we're working pretty long days when we're up here. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, there's really a fantastic schedule for us of research. Um, there's hundreds of experiments that we're doing on board every day. And so we want to put the time in and make sure we get good data and good results. And there's always a little bit of maintenance work to be done, like Jeff said. Um, but it's pretty enjoyable when you can float upside down and sideways to get your maintenance work done. Very cool. Now, there's been so many advances in space history. What inspired you guys to become astronauts? Well, for me, I think uh, certainly I grew up uh, in the Apollo era, uh, and I was old enough to remember the Apollo 11 moon landing. So that certainly was an inspiration. But uh, I first realized that uh, it was possible for me when I was at the military academy at West Point, and I read the book, The Right Stuff. The first Army astronaut, General Bob Stewart, was selected. Uh, and, of course, I was, gonna, I was anticipating a career in the Army, so I knew it was possible as an Army officer. Uh, and that's when I set it as a goal. I think it was 1978, 79, um, and it took me till 96 to be selected, and 2000 uh, was my first flight. Yeah, and when I was a kid, ever since I can remember, um, I had a, a list of career goals, and astronaut was one of them. Uh, and it wasn't until I was about in high school uh, that it, it seemed like maybe astronaut wasn't just an absolute uh, number one career choice that was going to happen. So I let that go for a little while and uh, then applied really as soon as I had the minimum qualifications. Can you tell us about some of the preparation you guys went through to become an astronaut? Yeah, we do a lot of training on the ground. So it's years of training before we get assigned to a mission and, and we fly. And uh, it's a it seems like a kind of a grab bag of training. It's really this pretty diverse set of training. But each element really comes to play 
once you're on board the space station. So we do things like Russian language. We do a lot of aviation training and flying. Uh, we train for EVA. We train with the robotic arm. And um, so you end up being a specialist in a whole bunch of different areas. It's a lot of fun on Earth, but it's really fun to see how it all comes together uh, when we're doing our actual execution of the mission on board. I would also add that uh, this is in an international space station with uh, uh, contributions from uh, Russia, the European Space Agency, Japan, Canada, and of course NASA. So we end up traveling to all those places and training in, in those environments, uh, which is a uh, um, pretty uh, um, uh, robust or pretty exciting part of the experience as well. Also, up here we can't call the plumber or the electrician or even uh, the emergency medical team if something goes wrong. So we get training in all those areas as well. Wow, so it's like a, a, you're literally a one-man band with every astronaut. We're well, I would say band. a six-person crew, that, <laughs> a six-person team, along with an, a very extensive uh, 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 ground team in Houston, in Moscow, in Munich, Germany, in Scuba, Japan as well. Yep, very cool. All right, now we have some questions from some of our fans. Um, Elizabeth L. would like to know, what was the most surprising part about being on the space station, uh, or what is, uh, and something that you maybe didn't expect that the NASA didn't tell you about? Well, NASA has prepared us really well, but I think um, nobody can fully communicate to you what it's like when you see the Earth and to be passing over all these different places in the globe. So just as an example for today, uh, Jeff showed me the Himalayas and, and uh, how the Earth uh, is is got all of these different dimensions when you start getting the mountainous structure. Uh, we looked at the aurora. I saw a meteorite going through the atmosphere for the first time. So there's really nothing quite to prepare you for all these different sites that you see, even though you can do a lot of studying on the ground. Very cool. Now, Ayla asks, after spending time living in space, do you think it actually will be possible for humans to inhabit outer space? And when do you think that's going to really begin? Well, I think we're inhabiting outer space right now uh, for six-month durations anyway. And Scott Kelly, of course, uh, stayed up here for uh, just under a year. Um, and we, we will inhabit, we'll, you know, with the moon, I'm sure, will be in the future. Uh, and of course, Mars is the ultimate target. Um, but Earth is very unique in that Earth provides all of the things necessary to support life. In this destination here in the station, as well as those others that I mentioned, uh, we have to bring the provisions uh, to support life with us from Earth. You know, the air we breathe, the food, uh, the uh, the other supplies that we have all come from Earth. Uh, so it's, uh, I guess you could say, uniquely provisioned. But certainly it's possible to inhabit places like this. We've shown it for going on 16 years now. Very cool. Now. I'm a total conspiracy theory, tinfoil hat wearing, mild lunatic. So I have to ask the question, you know, do you guys believe in intelligent life? And have you ever seen anything that made you kind of go, hmm, what was that? Uh, certainly you see things once in a while, you go, hmm, what was that? But never has it uh, been um, even a possibility of, say, the, the classic UFO that you see uh, folks talk about or aliens or all that. So to answer that part of the question, no, I think uh, those are um, those are fairy tales. <laughs> all right. Hey, well, guys, thank you very much for your time and uh, appreciate all the work you guys are doing. Uh, and that concludes our uh, Facebook Live. Thanks so much. It was great to talk to you. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. And thank you, KGO TV and the History Channel. We are now resuming operational audio communication.